not grievous. First Corinthians 15, 1. We all know it. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, wherein also ye, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, key word, how that Christ died. Notice it doesn't say that Christ died. It says how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Go to Romans 3, 26. This is what I would say to the denominational darling. I wouldn't help the gospel. I would just preach it. <clears throat> Romans 3 and verse 26. And if I, I'm looking for that first side from Jen, I haven't seen it yet. But it's early. It's early. Romans 3, 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just. And the justifier of him which believeth is Jesus. He does it all. He's the one that justifies you. It was his faith to go to that cross, to become your sin, to trust his father, to raise him out of that grave so that you can have eternal life and have a purpose in heavenly places forever and ever and ever. And that is what I would preach to the denominational darlings of churchianity. <clears throat> Reading on, where is boasting then? Many sermons this weekend about boasting and the emptiness and vanity of boasting. It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That's how you would open in dealing with the leaders of the uh, men of reputation in the church system. Now let me pause, and I'll come back to those rascals in a moment. How about you? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. And in good speaking technique, I might be panning, and if she does a sigh over here, I need somebody to tell me. I need a signal. Ephesians 3. <laughs> Starting in verse 1. Ephesians 3, starting in verse 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Who is he the prisoner of? Jesus Christ. Brother Jerry Lockhart taught all that Paul went through to get the gospel of grace to a Gentile dog like me out in Colorado. That's where I'm from. <laughs> And at the end of it all, the Lord Jesus Christ threw him in that jail, and he penned the words of life for me found in Ephesians and Colossians. The capstone of all Pauline revelation happened because he was the prisoner of Jesus Christ for me, Gentile. <clears throat> Verse 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, you were. How that by revelation you made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote <laughs> afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Notice that the mystery was hid in God, not in the Old Testament, not foreshadowed. Not a thought and a glimmer and something that we just sort of figured out. It was hid in God. That's pretty hidden, folks. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of Israel's promise in Christ by the gospel. No. Because Paul uses the word promise doesn't give you license to read the word promise back into Israel's program. Read Ephesians to find out what our promise is. <clears throat> Unto me who am less, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 7, 
whereby I am made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now watch. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Is the word fellowship in that sentence a person, place, or thing? It's a thing. It's a noun. If you know them, just throw them out. Is the mystery a person, place, or thing? Yes, also a noun. What's hidden in God? The fellowship of the mystery. We are a mystery body with a mystery purpose, with a secret calling. And it's only a secret now because the denomination won't open the book and read about it. But you want to see who is the fellowship of the mystery? Look around you. Look to your right and your left. That will help you see the fellowship of the mystery. It will not come through head knowledge. It will not come through education. It will only come through the spirit activating the words on the page and empowering you to see that we are part of something unique. And it's not because we're any good. It's because he's so good. But you are part of a special purpose, a different purpose. And the great tragedy of denominational teaching is they want to take your purpose and your inheritance and your destiny, which is to reconcile heavenly places, and they want to commingle it with stuff down here. And that is the great tragedy of denominational Christianity. That and sending you on to hell by trusting in something other than the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross. Ephesians 3.11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is that purpose? Back up a verse. This is your inheritance. This is the promise. This is the purpose for the seal. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers where in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. God had a secret body from time and eternity past. And he's using that body not only to repossess heavenly places, but to show off his grace in light to, in ages to come. That's what he's doing with you. So when you're thinking about healing and finances and all the things associated with all this old dirty flesh, we're forgetting our purpose as the fellowship of the mystery. We are going to have a bird's eye view when the Lord cleans house in heavenly places. Amen? I know Jerry didn't like when he asked for an amen, but I was needing an amen right there. <laughs> That's who we are. That's what you need to be mindful of. You get downtrodden, I'm part of the fellowship of the mystery. You lose your job, I'm part of the fellowship of the mystery. When I got saved and found out I was part of something that was not some man-made contradictory series of mistakes and explaining away the Bible and understood the pure fact that God saved me to put me in heavenly places in Christ Jesus to seal me into the day of redemption and to do things with me in eternity to come, guess what it caused? Cockiness? Proudness? Not at all. The hallmark of this dispensation is thankfulness. Thankfulness. Paul talks about being thankful and rejoicing more than probably any other subject or theme in the Pauline epistles. I'm thankful that I'm part of the fellowship of the mystery, and it upsets me, and it makes me very angry when people are deceived about what God is doing today. There is a war out there, and the people aren't our enemy. It's a spiritual conflict. But there is a war. So the, after that little diversion on who we are, let me resume preaching to the denominational darlings. The second thing I would do after telling them and pleading with them to hear the gospel of their salvation and praying that it would be effectual and change them. It only takes one superstar of the so-called Christian movement 
for God to take what they were doing as evil and do great good. You imagine one of those guys standing up and saying, Paul is my apostle. I'm saved by grace. I don't need to pay tithe. I don't need to be a member. What would happen? Can you imagine? They're not the enemy. I want to see those folks get saved. I want to see my enemies get saved. But what else would you do? The second thing I would do would teach them God's purpose as he dispenses his dealings with mankind. Wouldn't you take them and teach them the dispensational truth? We do not need to be afraid of the word dispensation. The fact that God deals with man differently at different times for different purposes just makes sense. If I write a letter to my son and I say, be home by 11, and I write a letter to my six-year-old daughter and say, don't leave the yard, and you pick up those letters, I look like I'm giving contradictory information. I'm not. I'm dispensing truth to one audience for one purpose at one time, and I'm dispensing truth for another audience for another purpose at another time. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ tells his followers to sell all that they have. Paul said, if you don't work, you don't eat. If you don't provide for your family, you're worse than the infidel. Dispensational truth makes sense. Otherwise, this Bible is a series of lies and contradictions. That's it. It's very simple. Okay? We're not building an ark today. I know we've used that example, but you've got to simplify with those who have been deceived in the denominational system. Okay? There are three dietary changes in God's dealing with mankind from the book of Genesis alone. So if God is a dispensationalist, what's wrong with a Bible believer being a dispensationalist? I don't shy from the word. Paul uses the word. And if it's good enough for Paul, who is my pattern to use the term, I'm happy to use the term. So I would teach them about God's dealing. And we might go to the chart. We may or may not. It's because I know Jack hasn't given me a lot of time. <laughs> but there are two programs in God's word, two significant dealings. There's prophecy and there's mystery. The prophetic program concerns Israel and it, and it concerns two inheritances. But I wouldn't even get into that with the denominational darlings. I would tell them <clears throat> that on the authority of Acts 3, 21, that there is a dealing with mankind that was known since the foundation of the world. And it concerns man's repossession of planet Earth. I would keep it that simple. And in order to do that, God had a special people with which whom he made covenants and promises. And you can read about it from Genesis to the Old Testament books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. God hit a big divine pause button. And you can resume reading about it in Hebrews through Revelation. And all that you find in there was known since. Known since is different than hidden from. What Peter and the Twelve said, known since. What Paul said, hidden from. Known since is different than hidden from. And I would keep it that simple. Paul's message does not concern the earth. For those of you who are into a little more of the meat of God's word, it, in his later ministry, did not concern a city. It concerns heavenly places. Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. It's no accident that the first verse of the Bible talks about the theme of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It doesn't bother me that 90% of God's word is not written to me. I just want to know the 5 or 8% that is written to me. And what is written to me and what directly applies to me is that body of truth found in Romans through Philemon and the associated fellowship that it records. And you are the fellowship of the mystery. And after teaching that about God's purposes concerning Israel and the earth, I would hammer home our purpose. You do not study, you do not understand the counterfeit dollar by studying counterfeit dollars. You understand the counterfeit dollar by studying the real dollar. 
So if I had an audience, and I would hope some of the denominational darlings by some chance would hear my voice today, if you understand our purpose, you understand what we are, then logic would suggest it's easy to understand what we're not. So go with me to Colossians 1.16. Colossians 1.16. And I haven't got to the part about God being wrathful yet. The circle back hasn't even occurred yet, but we're trying to get there. Colossians 1.16 For by him, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Proof 4005, that the rapture takes place before the second coming, and that we're the firstborn from the dead. Israel's resurrection is out there at another time. I think that's rabbit trail six for anyone keeping statistics. That we might be the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Now watch our purpose, and it's not to get a Cadillac or to heal your cancer. Watch our purpose, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile... That means to restore to its original condition all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth, that's Israel, or things in heaven, look around. That's the fellowship of the mystery. Christ is going to reconcile the heavenly places for Christ's sake to get the glory, and he's going to use you to do it. That's your purpose. Ephesians 2 6, to have raised us up together. Gonna have to hang out with each other for a long time. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Go to 2 Corinthians 5 1 and look at the way the verse is written very carefully. Ah, the power of a comma. For those of you who think we're coming back here. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle was dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands. Where is it? Eternal in the heavens. That's your purpose. You will be eternal in the heavens. 1 Corinthians 6, 3. Here's your purpose. Know ye not that we shall judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life. You know, Paul's message right there is knock it off over the mundane day-to-day -day junk that happens down there. Do you not know your purpose? We're going to judge angels. And what do you want to argue about down here for? Those are strong words. But if you understand your purpose, and then you look at what's taught by the Baptists, the Methodists, the Pentecostals, all the isms out there, they have nothing to do with making men see the fellowship of the mysteries in our heavenly position. And I'll come back to our heavenly position nine times out of ten sermons because we're missing it. It's not emphasized enough. And you want to get your mind off of down here? Understand your position in Christ. The next thing I would do is then circle back to the fact that God is furious right now. You may not agree with that, but he is. Now, is he furious with you? No, he cannot be. Is he furious over the sin issue? No, that would be double jeopardy. God took my sin and he imputed it to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he took the Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness and he imputed it to my account. And when that transaction occurred, that was it. 
I am at peace with God, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if you've never trusted that, believe it. Just believe that he died for your sins and was raised for your justification. So he's not mad about the sin issue. The sin issue is gone. I love the sermon where I think it was Troy's uh, testimony. He said he didn't even think about his sins the day after he got saved. Denominations want to make sin the issue. They put sin on a pedestal. Don't tell us gracers that we don't take sin seriously. It was so serious that God Almighty had to become man and fix the problem. We take it more seriously, but when it was solved, it was solved. I don't think about my sins. I think about how can I stand fast in my liberty by reckoning myself dead and just letting Jesus live. That's a formula for you that relies solely upon Christ. But why is God furious? He is mad. He is mad right now. He's been mad in times past. He's mad in the flood now. And he's going to be mad in ages to come. And it's all for the same reason. Let's go to Romans 1 and find out why our creator is furiously mad. And you don't want the one who spoke this universe into existence and could take behemoth and do this, think, mad at you. Do we forget the fear of God? I'm preaching to the denominations out there. Do you really want God mad at you? You put guilt on your followers every Sunday. Here's a little for you. Here's what's written to you. Romans 1, starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God. Serious words. There are no throwaways in the King James Bible. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Watch it now. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. He's mad at any man, any woman, any teacher, any group, any sect, anyone that knows God's truth. And holds it in unrighteousness. And twists it and turns it and perverts it. He's mad. That's not a sin issue. That's a doctrinal issue. And he's not having it. Watch in times past. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are what? Without excuse. Without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. How about those that know that Paul is their apostle and magnify him not in his office as their apostle? It's the same thing. <clears throat> when they knew him not God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made. Now watch this. Watch the order. Like the corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. What's the order? Man. Four-footed beasts. Oh, was it bird second? No, nope, bird. Now let's pause for a second. What do you think of when you think of the devil? What does he look like? What does he look like? Is he... They have a pitchfork and horns and a red suit? No. Hmm. Was not Satan the anointed cherub that covereth? There are no accidents in God's word. 
Stay there in Romans, but let's go, because we're going to come right back to it. Go to Ezekiel chapter 10. Holding the truth in unrighteousness, the cherub becomes the God. The cherub becomes the God. Ezekiel 10, 8. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man under their wings. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubims, one wheel by a cher one cherub, and another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was of the, as the color of barrel stone. And every one had four faces. Now watch how the King James Bible is its own dictionary. You don't need Greek. You don't really need a lexicon. All you need to do is let God's word define God's word. And everyone had four faces. The first was the face of a cherub. So you can go back and say, well, what, what is that? We'll come back to that. The second was the face of a man. Face of a man. <clears throat> and the third, the face of a lion. We can come back to that. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. There's two of the four represented. So what is this cherub? I don't know what the word is. Instead of running to some Hebrew professor of Old Testament studies, I'm going to let the King James Bible define for me what does a cherub look like. And let's stay right in Ezekiel to do so. Go upstairs to Ezekiel 1, verse 10. Speaking of the same creature... As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So cherub equals ox, or a bovine, cattle-looking creature. So we have everything there, but creeping things, and we also have the face of a lion. You want to know what Satan is called in 1 Peter 5, 8? Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. In the battle on the cross, in Psalm 22, verse 11, a prophetic psalm about Jesus' battle on the cross. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have been, been beset around me. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Man, ox, eagle, lion. How did Satan manifest himself in the Garden of Eden when he deceived Adam and Eve? As a creeping thing. Was he not a serpent and probably walked around and secondary to the curse was anyways put on his belly? Probably your vision of a serpent or a dragon. Now go back to Romans 1 and see if Paul doesn't give you an order of exactly what mankind did. It's right there for anyone to read, Romans 1. <clears throat> Picking it up in verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like to corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Ancient man worshiped angels. If you go to Ephesus, you will see Baal worship. You will see the ox, the creeping thing, the bird, you will and the lion. If you read the ancient book of Kells, which is the oldest surviving manuscript of a Latin Bible on earth, these four things are artwork on every page. Satan's footprint in holding the truth in unrighteousness is on every culture, in every planet, in every story, and in every myth in the entire world. You can't miss it. Jen and I had the great opportunity to walk around Corinth 
And it was the most amazing thing, and I thank God for the opportunity. Baal worship, which is, again, this ox-fertility god-looking fella, was everywhere. Veneration of birds all over the place. Go spend some time in the Vatican and see how they turn the truth of God into a lie. All over the place. The ox, the birds, the creeping things. What happened? These things were created to be beautiful. The hosts of heaven, they had a responsibility and a job. The Bible says that they had nations divided for them. They were to serve man under the agency of God, were they not? And God start, and man started worshiping them. So, the things of God got blended by the devil. That sounding familiar. Taking something true. Satan was beautiful. He had every precious metal built into his garment. Probably why you ladies like the jewelry. He had musical instruments built into him. The hosts of heaven were beautiful. Instead of giving God glory for them, we worship the creature instead of the creator. Is that not blending truth with error? You know, any child will reject poison. You put strychnine on the table, they'll walk away from it. Put it in an M&M, &M, and they'll eat it. <laughs> Holding the truth in unrighteousness from the beginning is the blending of something good with that which is evil. It's taking yesterday's truths and making them today's lies. If God is dispensational, and I tell you to build an ark for your salvation, I'm taking something that was good and I'm turning it into a damnable lie. If I'm telling you to be baptized for the remission of sins, instead of understanding that we have now received the atonement, I'm taking something that was good and I'm making it into a damnable lie. Israel was the worst offenders of iniquity. Iniquity is what I'm talking about. Holding the truth in unrighteousness. Blending truth with error. They had signs and miracles. They had the oracles of God. They had direct manifestations of God Almighty. They had the blessing, the promises, and every advantage. What did they do with them? They were the worst idol worshipers in the history of mankind. Right in the temple. Let's look at one example, and I'll fast forward to today's holding the truth in unrighteousness. Let's just go, well, let's just stay in Ezekiel. Probably a good place to read. Probably a good book to read about the mixture of truth and error. And I'll just read this, and you'll see the error of blending truth with lies. Ezekiel 8, 1. I'm just going to read through this, and I consider you to go back and read it in detail. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld the low likeness of the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward, fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head. That's good imagery right there, huh? How'd you like that to happen? <laughs> and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looketh towards the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy. You can read about what the image of jealousy is, but it has to do with setting up Baal worship in the temple. We'll get there. <clears throat> and behold, the glory of God of Israel is there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. And then he said unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way towards the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. 
He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abomination that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Are these abominations going to be lying and cursing, going to the brothel? No. They're spiritual idolatry. They're running around on God. <clears throat> greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. When I dig in the wall, behold, the door. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts. That'd be like your centaur and your minotaur and all the things that happen on the other side of the flood. Abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. This is in the temple of the Most High God. <clears throat> and there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel. In the midst of them stood Jehaniah, the son of Shaphan. I told you you'd be referenced today, Shaphan. With every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said unto me, Son of man, thou hast seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark. Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not. Yes, he does. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said unto me, Turn thee again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for handmaids. Did not see that would teach you that this was the first false antichrist, virgin born pretender since this side of the flood. This is the son of Nimrod. And Semiramis, and he's worshipped all over the world under different names. And there are the women weeping for Tammuz in the house of God. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than me. And he brought me into the inner court, the inner court, the sanctum sanctorum. This is the inner court of the temple. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. That's Israel. That's the group to whom God delivered out of Egypt, parted the Red Sea, and showed up directly a number of times. They held the truth in unrighteousness. They had the truth, and they held it back, and they blended it with error. That's holding the truth in unrighteousness, and there's no escaping the wrath of God for those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. How about today? Let's fast forward and wrap this thing up for today. First of all, there is a war. There is a crowd out there that holds the truth in unrighteousness, and guess what? We are lazy gracers. We are not doing enough about it. Watch what has happened or happened to our pattern, the Apostle Paul. Go to 2 Corinthians 11. Corinthians 11, 24. Here's our pattern. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. Any of you have been beaten for preaching the gospel of the grace of God? If you receive stripes <clears throat> from a cat at nine tails that probably showed some rib tissue when it was done, that happened to Paul five times. Thrice beaten with rod, once stone, thrice suffered shipwreck, a night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, 
imperiled by my own countrymen, imperiled by the heathen, imperiled in the city, imperiled in the wilderness, imperiled in the sea, imperiled amongst false brethren. Over in Acts 20, 24, what does Paul say about this? What does he say about those who want to kill him for his ministry and his message? He says, none of these things move me. We are lazy gracers. We need to be motivated to reach those stuck in denominational lies and get them out of there. <clears throat> and to close it, because we are obviously over time, as I've been graciously told, <clears throat> those that hold the truth in an unrighteousness, I'll just rattle off for you what they do today. And for every indictment, there's a Pauline truth that you can counter it with. Everyone. One, their orientation is earthly. We spend a lot of time saying our orientation is heavenly. So the Pauline truth is that our conversation is in heaven, from whence we look for the Savior. Two, they stand accused of making the cross of Christ of none effect through guilt and reward, sin confession and tithing. You know, Galatians 2 puts an end to all guilt and all reward. Everything you were guilty of was poured out upon God's Son. And just the reward is, He loves you and gave Himself for you. And the life you now live is by the Son of God. There's all the guilt gone. And there's the greatest reward you can ever imagine. You're crucified with Christ. Three, they stand accused of activating dead flesh through ordinances. Every time you tell the flesh not to do something, it's going to do it all the more. Every time you put a rule on dead flesh, it's going to say, how is the rule administered? What committees do we need? What's the consequences for doing it? And how can we glory in the flesh for those who do a little bit better job of not doing it? Except for what they do in secret. They activate dead flesh through ordinances. Paul in Colossians 2.10 says ordinances are contrary to us, and he retrospectively slapped them on the cross where they belonged. We have no ordinances, and if they were contrary to us, it was never good for the body of Christ to be under ordinances. Research that as you like. If it's contrary, it's not good. It's contrary. Paul says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. If you're water baptizing today, that's two, and two is more than one. They stand guilty of creating an organization. You know, it's easier to be accepted in the beloved than it is to be accepted in the Baptist church. There's something wrong with that. You don't receive Christ. Christ, God, receives you on the basis of what Christ did. The denominational systems have it upside down. Lastly, they are guilty of not being faithful stewards of the mysteries. That's our job. It's the most serious job we have to take this message, which was hidden in God, and now to proclaim it to the world. We are to be faithful stewards of the mystery. We are not to blur the distinction. We are to seek out and find and let God's word teach us more distinction. 1 Corinthians 4.1 Let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, in stewards it is required that a man be found faithful. The sentence after the indictment is wrath. My plea to the denominational darlings as was stated in many earlier sermons right here in my notes there is just one plea and it's in 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you.